Welcome in to Locked On, Knicks, Alex Wolf and Gavin Shaw here, and we've got play reviews from this past season. Today, we're talking about Mitchell Robinson. Is he the guy to build around at the center position, or does his style of play mean the Knicks will eventually have to make a change? And Jericho Sims, what does he bring as a backup? Could he potentially be the backup at some point, or is he destined to be more of a fringe NBA player throughout his career? We'll talk about all that and more right now on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks, and today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code LOCKED ON. That's prizepicks.com, promo code LOCKED ON. And I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us a part of your daily routine. Make sure if you want to be in every day or to hit that uh, auto download function on your favorite podcast app or the notification bell on YouTube so you never miss an episode. We're still here for you guys many days a week, even though it's the off season. So we got Nick's content for you every single day, just like right now. Uh, but I'm Alex Wolf. I'm editor in chief of Nick's site, the Strickland, and you can find Strick.land. He's Gavin Shaw. Favorite play-by-play broadcaster, favorite play-by-play broadcaster. And as I mentioned in the intro today, we're starting in earnest our player reviews and starting in the middle with the, the largest man on the team, one of the largest presences on the team this year, Mitchell Robinson. Gavin Mitch this year uh, played in 59 games total regular season-wise, of course, 58 starts. Uh, in those games, he played 27 minutes per game, averaged 7.4 points, 9.4 rebounds, 1.8 blocks, and 0.9 steals per game, and shot 67.1% from the field, and a pretty woeful 48.4% from the free throw line, which is uh, less than ideal in the grand scheme of things. Uh, he also was a plus 5.5 net rating per 100 possessions per basketball reference but was a minus 2.6 in the playoffs, whereas Isaiah Hartenstein was a positive. So where does that leave us as we start evaluating Mitch here for his season this past year? I I think it's such a fascinating question because if I, if I can zoom out a little bit, Mitchell Robinson to me is, is the piece of the puzzle that if you take him out, it it all sort of crumbles at, at least in the regular season version of the Knicks. And I'm not saying that they sucked, when he was off the court, I'm saying that he was so essential to their identity that their identity without him was a completely different thing. Could it be a better thing? Maybe. I'm not really sure. But the Knicks, and, and this was something we were, we were talking about pre-show, you were really driving home. Um, the Knicks were a top three offense in the NBA. I always reference it, but I'll, I'll keep referencing a top five offense in NBA history just because it blows my mind, um, statistically at least. And, and that was driven largely by Mitch's ability to collect offensive rebounds. Sure, Jalen Brunson. Had a lot to do with it. He was essential. Julius Randle, all-star, second-team All-NBA, yada, yada, yada. They, they were helpful, too. But Mitch's rebounding and brute force was the identity that drove the Knicks back into the playoffs. It was the identity that uh, drove the Cleveland Cavaliers season into the ground. It was the identity that left Jared Allen saying, the lights were brighter than I expected in here. And yet, Alex, in the second round against Miami, a team that said, all right, we're just going to uh, take away that strength and we're going to crash the glass relentlessly. We have a guy who's big, strong, and can jump super high and bam out of bio. And we're going to dare your shooters to go beat us. And the Knicks couldn't do it over the course of six games. They came pretty close, like two, three plays away. Maybe they get to game seven at home. Maybe things are different. Maybe that's worth trying again. But Alex, to me, I wonder if that's an identity that works in the playoffs. And, and we were discussing this, but in a world where the Knicks have better shooters and better scorers, Sure, in some ways, life is easier for Mitchell Robinson, but does he become less essential? And is there a higher ceiling version of the Knicks where Mitch isn't such an essential piece? Yeah, I guess it comes down to, like, do they need more shooting out of the five spot to achieve better shooting overall? Or can they find a way to have better shooting with Mitch still playing the five? Because I think, you know, it's like, so, for example, here's a here's a a good stat that I uh, really enjoy here. I got this off cleaning the glass. Uh, He rebounded 17.2 
percent of Nick misses, which is the 98th percentile among bigs. So he was nearly the pace setter for offensive rebounding this year, as far as just pure offensive rebounding percentage. He led the league in box outs per game at 3.1. That included being first in offensive box outs, second in defensive box outs. So that's fantastic. And that's a, a, you know, something that you hope to have all the time on the floor is a guy that can just take away the other team's best rebounder to give a guy like a Josh Hart a chance to get another rebound. But then there's the case of like, you know, we as you said, we saw in the playoffs when the shots aren't falling well enough and then they shoot like, I don't know what their total shooting percentage was from three in the playoffs, but it had to be around 30%. It was like, 20, it was like 29%. Yeah, 29, 30%. I mean – can any team win in the playoffs when they shoot that poorly? Like, not I more don't, than one round, apparently. <laughs> exactly. Like, I don't think so. Like, so I almost, I'm more inclined to say that I think, I think the thing with Mitch, it's not like, I don't think that the way that he plays necessarily hinders anything. I think that in many ways, the Knicks just need to develop. And like, guys like Quentin Grimes, Emmanuel Quickly, RJ Barrett need to find their consistency shooting from three in the playoffs because. If they could just make some more of those, then that's a huge swing, you know, and and that helps them a ton. But the offensive rebounding and those second chance points from Mitch will always be there, even if there's slightly less of them. Um, so I, I kind of lean towards like unless a a hugely better option would come along, like if you get the opportunity to get like Joel Embiid or something at the center, who's like not just a better shooter, but an all around better player and and just one of the most dynamite scores in the entire game uh i think they could win and continue getting better with a player of mitch's play style at center um and i i don't think it's that far-fetched yeah i i think i think the counter argument would be all right then why were they better with isaiah hardenstein on the floor during the playoffs and to me it's it just having a, a center who even if they don't pull the opposing center totally away from the rim just a guy that can't be completely ignored um, unless they have the ball a foot away from the basket or kind of what Miami did. Like even when they get the ball, you, you just have to be within foul's length of Mitchell Robinson, right? That was the scouting point. And to Mitch's credit, he made a lot of big free throws. Uh, down, he, I think it was, was a game five where he made mm-hmm. uh, yeah, where he went four for six down the stretch. Like those were huge. That was amazing. If he can replicate that over a, a much larger sample size, that would be great. Those are some of his best moments as a Nick. Like he, he showed real guts, real determination. Like I don't want to dismiss what he did against Cleveland where we were making an argument that like, hey, like Jalen Brunson's great and all, but this guy might have been our best player for this series. And and, and you wouldn't get laughed out of the room saying that. Um, I say all that to say like there's a reason Isaiah Hardenstein had a more positive impact and that's because he could provide a bit more spacing than Mitchell Robinson could. And you, you talk about the three-point shooting percentage. I kind of wonder like, all right, but if there's a a center that uh, could space a little bit and just open up the lane, then you're getting Jalen Brunson with, with entire defenses converging and guys are getting even more open threes. The counter argument to that is like the heat relieving RJ Barrett and Josh Hart open by eight feet. Anyways, how much better could it get? So my, my point is there's, there's complicating factors there, but I think it's worth examining why the Knicks were better with high heart on the floor in the playoffs. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely worth examining. And I think we could probably do that in our next segment here and take a look at uh, Mitchell Robinson. Uh, Look at his defensive impact as well. We have some stats on that uh, and what he brings to the table in that regard, but also talk a little bit about could it potentially be worth at some point, you know, especially if a, if a big star comes along, potentially trading Mitch as part of a, a deal for a player that's not a center and then rolling with an Isaiah Hardenstein, because could they continue playing the way that they want to, if they have that type of player. Uh, but Gavin, first, I think maybe we should let everybody know about our friends at BetterHelp. Yeah, Alex, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. I am a quintessential people pleaser. Um, so I know that firsthand um, and very often put everyone else's needs over my own. And uh, honestly, uh, seeking out therapy is something that has made a substantial difference in that because I'm kind of more aware, a little bit more confident um, of when I'm doing that and then confident enough to speak up when I notice it happening. Um, therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life uh, so you can keep supporting others. 
without leaving yourself behind. If you're thinking of starting therapy, it's a great idea to give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. All right, uh, let's keep it going, Alex. Um, why do you think the New York Knicks were better with Isaiah Hartenstein on the court in the playoffs? Um, and to be fair, they were better defensively with Mitchell Robinson on the floor, 2.7 points better with, with Mitch on the court defensively, but offensively, almost five points worse with Mitchell Robinson on the floor. Yeah, I think it comes down to, I mean, there's a multitude of things. I think that one of the big things that helped a lot as far as Hartenstein on offense was the passing. And that's going to always be one of the biggest differences between these two players, right? Like, I think defensively, as we see, Mitch is just sort of like the better version of the two, but they can both provide a very similar style of defense where, you know, they're just not going to let anybody get near the rim. Hardenstein is a little more foul happy, um, but they both have good active hands. Like, they generate a lot of steals around the hoop. They generate a lot of blocks. Uh, you know, just all those impact plays that you want. Both of them are doing that, I think, uh, but I think that we could say without much argument that Mitch just kind of does all that a little better than Hartenstein does at this point. But then on offense, it's like Mitch's primary function is get open for lobs, set some picks, you know, and roll and and do that. And also just collect offensive rebounds and get dunks and easy putbacks off of that. Uh, or sometimes draw fouls, which as we know from that, that free throw percentage, not always the best proposition. Um, but like, I, th I think with Hartenstein, it comes down to that passing. The fact that, especially when the Knicks shooting isn't working quite as well, which it wasn't during the postseason, we saw a lot more of like Josh Hart making cuts to the hoop, uh, RJ Barrett making cuts to the hoop, you know, them uh, working a little harder to work those sort of actions in, which Mitch is just not useful in that respect. Like he's, he's definitely more ideal of a player to have out there when the team is taking and making a greater percentage of threes than what they were uh, in the playoffs. Because once that well dries up and you need to start getting inside more, it's tougher to leave that lane open with Mitch out there than it is with Hartenstein, who can at least with that, he doesn't even really have a jumper, but he at least has a floater, you know, from like free throw range. Just having that weapon, I think, makes the difference there uh, as far as on offense. But I, it still comes down to me, like, to in many ways the fact that Mitch could be so much more useful if the Knicks just had guys out there that can make more threes. Like even if they shot league average from three, like 35% or maybe league average is up to like 36% now, but whatever league average was this year from three, if they could shoot that against the heat, maybe they win the series. Like maybe they don't lose game one. Maybe, you know, they win another, they win one of the games in Miami or something like it just, I feel like, there was a greater chance that like the Knicks could have won, obviously if they made more threes, but also a greater chance that Mitch could have continued to look better had the Knicks just made more threes. And I, I think that could be a consistent theme going forward. Yeah. And I, I think it's worth noting that he was, he was that dominant from a rebounding perspective. And, and, and the one stat you had in here that you, you didn't say that I'll note real quick, second in the NBA in contested rebound percentage at 60.4%. Um, if the floor is a little bit more spread out and teams can't pack the paint, like they just have to, it has to be him versus the center one-on-one -on -one and not two, three, four bodies like crashing on him and boxing him out and fighting with him. That makes things easier for the Knicks. That makes things easier for Julius Randle from a rebounding perspective. And you could argue like, Hey, the philosophy clearly works. Like it drove the Knicks to the number three offense. They just need a better way to sustain it in the playoffs versus saying, all right, scrap this. This clearly doesn't work. And, and I think this, this to me is, is the theme of the whole off season. How do you improve without losing what made you good in the first place? And, and that is, is why things are, are almost at the trickiest point for the Knicks for an office. Like, like some people might, might look at this and be like, all right, the Knicks are in a golden position now. And they are in terms of their assets and their young talent. But it's going to be really tough to like it, – it's I almost like – the analogy I would use is like when Iron Man has to get like his iron heart out and, and, and just uh, – maybe I'm misremembering the first – three movies but um and, and just kind of get like a normal heart going it's like all right this is working but it's flawed like 
Like, can we take this out without him dying? Like, can the Knicks take out Mitchell Robinson without them dying? I don't know. I, I still think there's a higher ceiling there. Like, not even a Joel Embiid type of guy. But if you can find him, a Brooke Lopez type of guy. Granted, like I've said it a million times, those guys don't grow on trees. Like, there, there's a reason, like, he would have been a realistic all-star case this year. I think my concern with Mitch, Alex, I'm curious your take on this, is it, just is it, still a bit how injury prone he is. And it's not that he missed all that many games this year. But I just thought he was clearly hampered in the Miami series. And to me, that was the biggest difference maker where he went from someone who could completely revolutionize your defense to someone who, who made them better, but didn't quite have the same impact he did against the Cavs. And, and part of that was that Bam Adebayo could pull him away from the basket. But I think it was also that he wasn't moving quite as well. Yeah, he, he definitely was banged up. I think that was, you know, I didn't bring that up as part of why he didn't do as well as Hartenstein, but I think that was definitely part of it. I mean, there were certain parts of the playoffs where he just looked extremely uncomfortable. And, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's unreasonable at this point to say that he's at least a little bit injury prone. Now I've gone to bat for his injury history in the past though. He has had some kind of freak injuries, you know, like in particular 20 to 21 really stands out to me is like, people like to harp on that year. Like, Oh, he only played 30 games. Like, yeah, but, you know, he he had some pretty freak injuries that year. He had, like, a broken hand and a broken – what was the, it was, like, something else. Something else that was not, like, an, an injury that portends other injuries. You know what I mean? That there's going to be, like, oh, like, it's not like he's been busted up his knee every time or something. And yet this year, it seemed like the ankles, the knees, all those things kept getting injured over and over again. It just kind of added up. You know, I guess the ankles were sort of the story for the Knicks and for many teams in the playoffs this year. It seems like ankle injuries were just on the rise for whatever reason. But yeah, it it seems like you kind of he's becoming one of those players that because of various nicks and bruises. And look, he's a seven foot, seven foot one guy, you know, and he's he's large like and he's in a position where especially because of how the Knicks defend and how he plays like he's going to be hitting the deck quite a bit. Uh, because he's constantly dealing with contact, you know, and that means that you're going to occasionally, you know, fall down and that's going to keep happening and he's going to keep having all these nicks and bruises. So you're going to have to kind of just prepare for that. Um, I guess the question just becomes, can you like load manage him well enough to make sure that he could be playoff ready and all that? But we know with Tibbs, that's sort of like a curse word. Say like, oh, you mean you tell me you think we should rest a guy for five games before the postseason or something like that's blasphemy. But um yeah, I don't know. It's it is a tough decision for this front office, and I think if they could, in theory, find a Brook Lopez type player, but hopefully one that's younger. I mean, maybe that's Porzingis or something, but I don't know that I trust Porzingis is rebounding to yeah, or replace his, Mitch's his at all. injury history too, or his injury history to replace Mitch's. But you know, if if you could find someone that can give you eighty percent of what Mitch does in the things that he's really good at, but also shooting, I think you could really be cooking with gas if you're the Knicks, because then you've kind of unlocked both things uh, where you can have the guy sit in there and get the rebounds. We can also have him shoot some threes. So until such a player comes along though, I, I would not fault the Knicks for continuing to ride with Mitch and see what they have with him. Because I think that, I think this year proved that his impact, especially with the rebounding is like second to almost nobody in the NBA, as far as the impact that he brings in that very, uh, revived skill in the NBA. Like I feel like rebounding went underappreciated for a few years, and now is being very greatly appreciated again. Yeah, and I think I think my chief concern with Mitch is that his athleticism will continue to go down. Like I, I think you and I are in agreement that he he's, he he went from a 99th percentile freak when he came into the league to maybe like a like an 88th percentile freak now, which is still pretty freaky. And and when you combine it with like like there was a clear trade off there, right? He said I'm I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be more physical and I'll, I'll lose a little bit of hops. I'll lose a little bit of quickness. And, and to me, the dream for Mitch was always that he would be able to combine those two, but clearly there's, there's kind of a breaking point where, where he leans more than one way or another. And his current state might be the apex of both. And that's fine because he's still clearly a fantastic defensive player. And to our previous point, able to be arguably the best offensive rebounder during basketball, particularly when Steven Adams isn't healthy. But I, I just wonder, like, his, his effective field goal percentage this season was the second lowest of his career. It dropped all the way down to 60% in the playoffs, which, which most people would be like, oh, God forbid someone shoots 60%. But this is a guy who set the uh, NBA record, who was at 74% in terms of EFG one year. 
So if that continues to go the wrong direction, and granted, like most of what he does is catching and dunking, but because the Knicks don't have a lot of great lob passers, he has to be really athletic and have a really wide catch radius and really be able to jump to do that. And he has to be able to go up quickly. Like that, that was a repeated issue throughout the playoffs, Alex, where he would catch and he, he wouldn't get off his feet fast enough. And to me, I look at that, I look at, at like I see a combination of maybe his athleticism being slightly down and a guy to the, our previous point that was just beat up by the end of the year. And by the time of the Miami series, like granted, it might've been specific hits or things that happened against Cleveland. But to me, I, I think it's going to be a fluke if that type of thing does not happen in the postseason. Like I'd almost compare it to Joel Embiid with, where maybe he'll be on the court, but he will always be playing through something. And, and that is my big Mitchell Robinson concern. Uh, whether or not that means the Knicks should or shouldn't keep him, I'm not sure. I'm kind of on the record of saying like one of RJ Julius or him is going to have to go. Yeah, uh, well, I guess we'll see. And, and speaking of players that, whose shot diets mostly consist of dunks and who uh, play quite well and shoot quite well, we have Jericho Sims coming up next uh, to speak about. So we'll get into him in just a moment. But I do have to remind you all that today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks. And Prize Picks has the million dollar daily super flex promotion going on right now for the NBA Finals. Every day of the finals, one prize picks user will win a chance at becoming a millionaire. One entry placed after 8 a.m. Eastern will be randomly selected each day. Whoever placed that entry will be given a six pick flex with the following payouts. Six correct picks gives you a million dollars. Five correct picks gives you 80K. Four correct picks gives you $16,000. So full details can be found at prizepicks.com slash million. You must opt in at that link to be eligible for the million dollar entry. And once you opt in, all you have to do is play the game like normal and you could be the lucky winner. But how do you play the game like normal? Well, that's where prize picks is different. You might have played some of those other uh, daily fantasy games where you have to set a lineup based off like these arbitrary dollar amounts. And like there's all these people that have spreadsheets that tell them what the best lineups are and what the best ROI is and this, that, the other. If you don't want to have to look up all that crap and you just want to play, you should play prize picks because it's way more fun. All you do is just pick projections. It's you versus the computer, and that's it. Uh, they'll say, for example, Jimmy Butler, uh, over or under 26 and a half points. You pick what, what you think he's going to do, and then you just build out your entry that way. You can also do multi-sport entries, do like baseball and basketball together, and maybe add another sport in there. I don't know, whatever it is you feel like doing. And they have all kinds of sports available to choose from. So it's a, it's a very, very fun game and uh, one that I can't recommend enough as someone who occasionally likes to play some daily fantasy. So download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. If you deposit $100, PrizePix will give you $100. If you deposit $50, PrizePix will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code Locked On at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. All right, Gavin, we're back in, and we're shifting gears a little bit, but staying with the center position, and we're going to talk about Jericho Sims now, uh, who was the third stringer this year, but did get some a, a decent amount of playing time thanks to some injuries, both to Mitchell Robinson and Isaiah Hartenstein. Uh, Sims wound up playing in 52 games this year, which actually surprised me. I didn't think it was that many. Uh, 16 starts among those, 15.6 minutes per game. He averaged 3.4 points per game. 4.7 rebounds and 0.8 stocks. That's steals plus blocks per game. Also shot 77.6% uh, from the field, which is a Mitchell Robinson-esque number. Uh, you want to talk about guys that basically just dunk the ball. That's Jericho Sims. Um, I'm just going to throw all the stats at the wall, and then we can just kind of discuss Sims a little bit. But here's some stats I pulled. He raised the team total rebound percentage by 2.2% when he was on the court versus off the court. All in all, was a pretty resounding net negative, uh, which probably, I mean, has to do with some of the company he kept. Uh, but he was minus 11.8 net rating for the year on off, which is not great. But he played 17% of his minutes at power forward this year. And weirdly, that sort of worked for a little bit. Uh, so maybe we could talk about that in a second. Yeah. Uh, he was 99th percentile in points per shot attempt among bigs at 1.56. That's according to Clean the Glass. He was also first percentile in usage at 6.6%. That's really bad. That's, that's Those the two might possible. go together coincidentally. Yeah. It's kind of hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> that's up to 100. There's a reason for that. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And he was 61st percentile in block percentage at 1.8% and 88th percentile in offensive rebounding of Nick's misses at 12.7%. So 
kind of similar to Mitchell Robinson in many ways, but like a lesser version. Um, I don't know, Gavin, like uh, what did the Knicks do with Sims going forward? Like were those random moments at power forward worth something or is he pretty much just a center and pretty much just going to be a third stringer? Yeah. Well that, well, I mean, you're alluding to the defining stretch of, of not only his season, but his career so far um, where, where the Knicks went to the nine man rotation. Uh, and then Mitchell Robinson got hurt. And then all of a sudden the bench lineups were like, uh, what do we do? And we got a lot, or, or no, or that was when Obi Toppin got hurt. I'm sorry. And then the bench lines were like, uh, what do we do? And it was, it was Jericho Sims and Isaiah Hardenstein. And I, I was busy tweeting on the lock to Knicks account. Like, man, are, are the Knicks going to trade Obi Toppin? Because I can kind of see Tom Thibodeau just falling in love with this and being like, yeah, this is totally sustainable playing uh, two guys who can't shoot more than five feet away from the rim for the rest of the season. The defense is really, really good. Let's just, <laughs> let's just keep rocking with it. Um, and, and fortunately that is not what happened. Obi Toppin, uh, Rightfully got his rotation spot back. But you know what? In in defense of the most evil Tibbs I can imagine in my mind, it kind of worked, Alex. It kind of worked. Um, Do I think that is sustainable going forward? No, I don't really see a world. Even like, let's just say the Knicks traded Obi Toppin for a first round pick or two this year. Like, would would the Knicks roll into the season and be like, all right, Jericho Sims power forward? Like, nah, I think think teams would have caught on to it. I think they would have figured out ways to go against it. Um, and it, it was just part of this like kind of all in exceptional defensive stretch where Deuce McBride was flying around, Sims was flying around, Hartenstein was flying around. The Knicks got really poor shooting from opponents. Um, I don't think that was sustainable long term. Um, right now, I think I think he kind of is who he is. I think he's a third string. He's a very good third string center and he's like a below average backup center. But he could be in the right situation on the right team. Great insurance for the Knicks. I don't really know if we have to make more of it than that. Like, I really like the guy. I enjoy his play. I think the thing we all have to remember, though, is he's the exact same age as both Isaiah Hardenstein and Mitchell Robinson. Yeah, which is kind of crazy, right? Or he's like yeah. like a half a year less or whatever, yeah. but basically the same age. What is nice, though, is you do have him potentially locked up for two more years, uh, which is solid. So like Deuce McBride, for example, as a second round pick in that same draft who signed an NBA deal right away is potentially going to be a free agent after this coming season, uh, a restricted free agent, which would mean the Knicks have to kind of either lock him up or, or let him, you know, hit the open market and set his own price and yada, yada, yada. He's no longer a cost controlled asset. Now he's making whatever the NBA values him as uh, with Sims, because he signed a two way contract his first year, he signed a two plus one deal after that. So two years plus one, which is a team option. So the Knicks get to choose after this coming season, if they want to keep him, on for another season for a fourth season and basically the minimum i think he makes like two million or something his final year so pretty insignificant number all told uh, as far as the like 140 million dollar salary cap it'll probably be that next year so that's not too shabby i i do go back and forth like there's so many things to like about sims i think the main thing is the switchiness like if we want to talk about one thing that's very different from mitchell robinson at this stage of his career like mitch can still occasionally do his thing if he gets switched on to like a guard or a wing, but more often than not now plays those guys off a little more and it leads to threes and stuff being more open than they used to be where Mitch used to always be that threat to close out on a guy and, you know, get 15 feet in the air and and snatch a three point shot out of the air. Um, Sims does it a little differently where he's just really switchy. I mean, there's pretty much, there were so many times where he, got switched on to during that really good stretch where he was playing power forward. Part of the only reason that that like was able to work was because on defense, they're crushing it because he was just able to play on anyone. Like it, they would, other teams would try to generate a switch onto him and he would just bottle up even guards and, you know, like wings and really good ball handlers. And that was a super useful skill for him. So I actually wonder like, it, he almost seems like a player that if the Knicks had a different coach could potentially be like a true backup center. But as it stands right now, I don't know that he's like, because of his size and everything, I don't think that he's quite good enough to be Tibbs's like backup center because of what's required of that position under Tibbs, as far as the rim protection and, yeah. and the verticality and stuff and like the overall length required and like lack of fouling. But if you were under a different coach that would say, you know what, every once in a while, go switch everything. He might become a better player and, and be more viable as a potential backup center rather than just a guy that as of right now, I think would definitely just kind of slot into the third string role. And I would not feel totally comfortable having him be the backup. Yeah. I think it, it's kind of interesting because we just talked about trade offs with Mitchell Robinson. I think it's the same thing for Jericho Sims. It's almost like because you get that switchiness, 
you lose a little bit at the rim. And granted, you, you have your freaks, you have your Anthony Davises, your Jaron Jackson Juniors, even someone like Embiid to, to some extent or another, who, who can legitimately do both and, and do both exceptionally well. But generally in the NBA, you're only you're only getting one of those things just because the, the skill requirements are so vast and it's against players that are fantastic at very different things. And with Jericho, he has a lot of issues despite being a great jumper, just getting up in the air quickly, kind of similar to what I was saying about Mitchell Robinson on the offensive end, but Mitch really does not have that issue defensively. Jericho is more of a two-foot jumper. Um, and, and also just like, and this is something that hopefully, I, th- I think his third NBA season, if it's ever going to turn a corner, you'd see it turn a corner. He, he still feels like a little scared of physicality. Like he doesn't really want to just go straight up and go chest to chest with someone in the air, despite the fact that he's built for it. So I'm hoping that that could change, but it, it feels like a lot of times he jumps late and I can't tell if it's slow reaction or if he's trying to avoid contact. I think it's probably more so slow reaction, but he, he kind of ducks a lot of opportunities where I'm like, oh, he's about to just swat this dude. And then either he doesn't get there at all or he gets there late and fouls. And then offensively is like kind of the same thing, like really intriguing skill set, but I, it, it's it's almost too late for him because he's 25 instead of being 20. If he was 20, I was like, oh, you got to invest in this dude. Like he has, he's a floater game. Obviously he's incredible at lobs, but he's like nice touch around the rim. He has a little jump hook. Um, but it's kind of the same thing with Mitch where we see him work on it every year. And unless you have a team that's going to force feed a guy reps in those situations, like they're just never going to develop it um, in an NBA context where, where it's kind of a consistent weapon outside of something you can just use at the very tail end of a shot clock in an emergency. And with Jericho, unfortunately, I think, that's kind of his fate. Again, useful backup center because of the switchability, because of the athleticism, and because he's like a decently skilled offensive player. Um, but for the Knicks, having two guys better, like he he is sort of the third guy. And I wonder if he has another stretch where he either starts or is the backup and gets a lot of time and puts up decent numbers. Like, is he an interesting trade chip for the Knicks down the road, maybe? An interesting trade chip or a guy that at least makes them comfortable with the idea of like, okay, well, because Jericho is so good, maybe we trade like Mitchell Robinson is part of a trade for a, a bigger star that won't net us another center back, you know what yeah. I mean? And then roll with Hartenstein and Sims and say, that's good enough. Or vice versa. Like if they, if the Dicks get a robust market for Hartenstein for a team, that's like, that has their center go down and needs someone to step in. Like uh, then, you know, maybe the Knicks can say, Oh, well, Sims is good enough and we can just have him back up Mitch yeah. the rest of this year and not miss too much of a step. So um yeah, and no matter what, I think good player, maybe one who's already sort of capped out uh, to a degree, but hopefully not. You know, hopefully we see more out of him this coming year, uh, and, he, and he keeps getting better. So, uh, But that's it for this episode of Locked on Knicks. We're going to have more player reviews coming your way uh, throughout the coming weeks, as well as we're going to try to squeeze in some draft-ish content, um, maybe some stuff about how the Knicks can get into the draft. Uh, maybe some stuff about some of the guys that might go undrafted just so that there's something to look forward to for us uh, with the draft, considering this is normally a huge part of the year for us. And we're kind of this year like, well, <laughs> the Knicks don't have a pick right now. Uh, so we'll, we'll have some stuff coming up on that and a lot more on Locked on Knicks every day. So till next time, though, we will talk to you all soon and peace out, everybody.